session will be uh, about professionalization. Uh, it's a very important topic. Yesterday we heard that uh, competence may make a huge difference, have a very large impact of the performance in public procurement, and this is not surprising. Uh, since whatever rule uh, you um, design, uh, whatever policy you have in mind, at the end of the day, there are people that have to enforce the rule and implement the policy, and so the ability and the skills of those people, uh, of course, matter uh, a lot. Uh, there is something that uh, always uh, strikes, strikes me. Um, you know, sometimes uh, people ask a rhetoric question, uh, whether uh, something like procurement, for instance, is an art or a science. And I don't know whether you've noticed, but in this uh, dichotomy, science is the term that has a negative value. <laughs> so people are very proud to say, oh, well, this is a heart, not a science. Uh -huh. Now, I like uh, art a lot. Who doesn't? And I understand that being uh, an artist might be much more uh, charming than being a scientist, but I'm really fond of science as well. And I do think that uh, 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 lack of uh, scientific culture in many, many fields is, uh, is a problem. So the question that I'm going somehow to ask the two speakers today is whether uh, there is any chance to have more signs in public procurement. Uh, the two speakers are uh, Gustavo Piga, and okay, I don't need to introduce you, I guess, <laughs> <laughs> to this audience at least. <laughs> and, uh, and, and then we are very pleased to have um, uh, Karen Da Ponte uh, Thornton uh, from the George Washington uh, Law School. Uh, you, you both know the rules. Rules. The rules, and so uh, the floor is yours, Gustavo. Thank you, Paolo. It's a great honor to be here again today. It's a very interesting uh, way of introducing. Uh, I had never thought about this issue of arts versus science. I think it has to do with the fact that we would love to have it as an art, but I need to think about it. It's too soon, you told me. It has to do with our great desire of having discretion and thinking that arts bring, brings greater discretion. But then I think about Leonardo. And Leonardo was a, a great man of science, too, and uh, very rigorous in his art. So maybe the answer is that we should combine the two, but, uh, but, uh, but I don't know. Um, so I had a presentation in mind, but then I got the email of Karen, and I completely switched off uh, my project. And I said, this is a great idea. I, I, I don't know if Karen will, will stay with her idea. I don't know if she has changed her mind, or maybe I misunderstood her, her project, but basically she had decided to do something instead from top to bottom, from bottom to top. She said, basically, I'm going to talk from, uh, with the heart from my experience and telling you what my experience um, can bring to a, a general understanding of uh, what prof professionalization stands for. And so I said, well, I'm going to copy her. This is too much of a great idea. And so I apologize for her if I, um, but I think maybe it's a, it's a good way uh, there's going to be too many questions left unanswered, so I apologize for that. So let me start immediately from, uh, from, uh, from exactly, from who we are. So this is, uh, many of you will recognize it, <coughs> this is the 2018 program of the Master in Procurement. Uh, actually, it turns out that this is basically the program that we have been having, not for 2018, but for a long time. It has evolved over the years, but the basic thrust of it, obviously you see the logo of the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, who's the main supporter and actor of change in this uh, Endeavor, but also the African American Development Bank, our new partner that has entered uh, financing some of our African students, so importantly. Uh, you see that it's, what, what stands out is obviously immediately the interdisciplinarity of it and the fact that uh, there are three schools that offer this master. It's the only master in Tor Vergata that is offered jointly by three different schools, economics, engineering, and law. Um, and so, uh, 
I want to go over a little bit the history of what we do. But before doing that, uh, uh, it's not that obvious. I would like to think about the history of interdisciplinarity in the, for our profession. And this is a, a gentleman that uh, I had the pleasure and honor to meet while working at the European Commission, uh, Joaquim Nunes de Almeida. And this is one of the things that he wrote two or three years ago. And I think you've heard it in this room yesterday, market uh, business skills. But when I read this uh, piece of um, thought by this uh, leader in an organization called the European Commission, I was uh, ecstatic, delighted because it had been a battle since 2005 to say this is the way to go, interdisciplinarity is the way to go, and to read such a statement to me said we made it. Somehow we made it. And then I thought back of, of the history of this, and, and this is basically the history of it. There was a time, I call it the, the red time, the first stage, where there was a perfect equilibrium between what administration wanted from training and what universities were ready to provide in training. It was law only. The only thing you needed to know was the book of law. Presuming that that book was perfect, we were teaching that. We have plenty of evidence that universities were only teaching that. And then something occurred that brought us uh, in another equilibrium. Um, the equilibrium of interdisciplinarity where administration re asked from us and we wanted to give interdisciplinarity. So uh, I think one of the issues that we should discuss, and I have no answer really, again, is how do we end up doing this trip if we believe that this trip from one to the other is something for the better of society, like I strongly do. Um, why is it a relevant issue? Well, it's a relevant issue because sometimes we're brought to think that the first equilibrium, the first stage equilibrium, the red one, is due to development, right? So you are stuck when you are a low-income low or middle-income country in this trap. Look at, for example, this is a quote that I took from this Brookings report that I was uh, citing yesterday. It would seem that developing countries are left with the second best option, the establishment of extensive rules. This idea that maybe development will take you at a, cert, uh, or at a certain stage of development to the new equilibrium where interdisciplinarity is required, but because of the pervasiveness maybe of corruption that comes with the lack of development, I don't know, maybe we need a lot of rules. I am not fully convinced that this is the case, and I think actually that our master proves the contrary. We'll try to talk a little bit about that. Maybe, maybe this change is driven by sudden, um, sudden changes, whether it's uh, a university that takes the lead a central purchasing body. I don't forget that uh, our master, for example, was born out of the request from CONCIP uh, uh, to provide interdisciplinary education. Maybe governments, maybe societies require it, I don't know. But I think it's a, it's a very important question to, to ask, and uh, I believe that something can be done without waiting uh, and without worrying about whether it's good or not that low-income countries do that, do that kind of move. So this is our history. We were born into, and I will go over it uh, very, not that, not that quickly, actually. Uh, we were born in 2005 through the um, uh, generous support of the Minister of Economy and Finance and CONCIP, who did not put one dime, but they put their logo, which was already enough for us. They said, why don't we do an interdisciplinary master? The Minister of Economy and Finance had understood that there was this need of training in an interdisciplinary way. CONCIP obviously was taking the lead at the time on these issues. Uh, then the defense came in, and I, I will talk a little bit more about this master uh, later on. The second step in our growth was seven years later. It was not anymore a master that would uh, touch on to public, private, and defense procurement, but it was only related to public um, procurement, and it was meant to train officials from abroad, but in Rome, 2012 with the important, very important, critical support, and I will talk about this today, of the European Bank of Reconstruction and Development. Then, two years later, it was local. It was local in the sense that we were contacted by a regional body, Sardinia, my island, by the way, I was, uh, my family originally comes from there. Uh, and the project was to put together, this time, bidders and procurers. So it's still a project of public procurement, where, where the classroom is made of uh, bidders, firms, and procurers. I will talk a little bit more about that. 
Then in 2016, uh, there was a request to train executives. So with a certain average age that was kind of higher, people already working very extensively in the profession. And then uh, in 2017, we went abroad. And it was a joint venture that, was, uh, that had the colors, of, uh, the colors of Serbia and the colors of Italy. Um, and it's the master in procurement management, still, still public. So this is, our, this is our history. And thinking about the history and going back uh, in time, I think that uh, there are a few things that I wanted to share with you, some doubts or some things, starting with the first master that we created in 2005 that became very rapidly a master not only for public procurers, but with, for private procurers too. Now that is a key issue. We were criticized a lot at the time because of this move. Uh, we were told why put together <coughs> private sector and public sector and defense sector. They have different uh, needs. You cannot train them together. Um, and this was the key issue that we faced. And we basically ended up uh, deciding that it was worthwhile giving it a try and putting them all together. We thought that even if the private sector was doing things that were forbidden in the public sector at the time and still today, the public sector could learn a lot from the way private sector does procurement. Sometimes simply to push to become a lobby for change. But we also thought that the private sector had a lot to learn from um, the, the private sector had a lot to learn from the public sector, especially in terms of uh, social goals, sustainability, green procurement. Um, uh, this article, uh, I, I took it last night, it's an article about an issue that is happening where Google is now thinking of getting out of procurement from uh, uh, the defense sector in the United States. It's very, very interesting because if you read it, it basically uh, takes out a huge amount, puts on the floor a huge amount of ethical dilemmas. And when you read it, you say these ethical dilemmas are not only related to defense, they are related to public sector. They're related to private sector procurement. We learn a lot if we debate about these issues. It's, it's just the latest thing that I, that I read. And it became a true success because, because of this. Uh, by the way, there's another reason why I think the two things uh, can stay together. Look at this slide. It was prepared for uh, internal organizational issues of private procurement in uh, large firms. These are key concern of a group of uh, large procurers of multinationals in the private sector. Look at them. You read it. If I hadn't told you that uh, this is about private sector, you would have said, oh my god, the public sector really needs to discuss these issues too. It has come the time. So in many senses, there is a lot of synergies between the two that we can take advantage, that we can take advantage of. Then came the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development and, uh, and Jack's, Jack's idea of uh, pushing forward. And what was the issue at the time? I don't know. We were full of enthusiasm, so we basically said, let's do it. Uh, did we have a problem? Were we scared of something? I don't know. We were scared of many things, but maybe thinking back, one relevant issue could have been, should we mix them? And should we mix them in the sense that we were, without thinking, doing something a little bit crazy. We were saying, let's do this master, and let's not do the master for the Western world, for the developing world, for the middle income world. We couldn't care less. We said, let's do this to train public officials everywhere in the world independently of the capacity building average level and the system of rules that govern the countries where these students are working. Uh, and, and why we did that? Because we had a feeling. We had a feeling that independently of the prevailing rules, we had a feeling, the EBRD and us, that there was this huge thirst of knowledge in procurement that was unsatisfied and, uh, and when I say I want to really stress that uh, uh, this is not a one-way road. And the students of the master know it very well, and I think Karen knows it very well. Our teachers, our teachers have grown over these years so much because of the interaction with these professionals. These are not 18-year-old students. These are people that when they raise their hands, they bring knowledge to the classroom. Okay. So the thirst, in a sense, is also from the teachers. Uh, the, is this generating um, an issue? Yes, it generates an issue, but not at the level of the classroom. 
it generates a huge issues for those governments who finance the trip of these students because anyway, even if BRD pays, even if African Development Bank pays, don't forget, there are huge costs for administration of, get, of losing for four or five or six months very important individuals for the organization. And, uh, and this is the thing I think we really need to think about. Uh, once you've drunk, where do you go? And I think governments should ask this question. Because I think that, and we will talk about it, it's not only about professionalism, it's not only about learning, it's about organizational reform around quality of the people. So if these people come to Rome, if these people go to Nottingham, if these people go to Turin, whatever, if these people go to Belgrade, and they come back with such a thirst satisfied, with such a strength of knowledge, and they're said, oh, congratulations, that's your corner, please stay there where you started, then I think those governments will have an issue. I think that these people will say, okay, you know what? Why do I need to stay here if you don't motivate me, if you don't put me at the center of the revolution that you wanna do? I have uh, EBRD asking for me, I have EIB asking for me, I have the whole world asking for me. And so this is an issue that government should think. They should think about an investment that is a long-term investment, not just the 3,000 or 4,000 euro for the plane drive and the four months. But these are issues to be discussed. Again, I, I don't have an answer. Then we came with uh, the, the senior people uh, project. What do I have to say about, what, does, what is the excuse to talk about this? Uh, and, and this is, uh, what do we do with these people? Again, this is also relevant for the other masters, but let me put it in the context of this. Uh, should we fix them up with what? Uh, Elisabetta actually, Yossa is not here today. She asked me if I was going to talk about her paper. I said yes, but she doesn't trust me, so she said she wants to see the video. <laughs> uh, and so I say hello to Elisabetta. And uh, they came out with this very important paper regarding public procurement in the US. And uh, uh, this is what they basically said. Uh, we will come back to this paper because they find some very relevant um, results too. But what is interesting is they say, yes, professionalism is important, but what's most important, you can see the last sentence, but what really is important is how the organization functions around it, how the team is built. I think Karen is gonna talk a lot about these issues. Um, uh, and, and so this brings me to talk about, finally, I always, uh, uh, since um, Nikita said that uh, Pedro needed to give two minutes to the European Commission, I, I'm gonna give him also two minutes of blessing <laughs> since I always criticize the Commission. The Commission got fed up. I think it waited a long time. It waited for almost 10 years asking that governments would make a strategy for professionalism. And after they saw that nobody or almost nobody, UK except, uh, would move, they came out with these very, very, very important and useless recommendations. They are very, very important because they strike a chord on all of us. They are useless because it seems to me that governments are not moving. But I hope that it's not useless and that it will create that uh, change that we all wait for. Um, there's many things I really recommend, the students have, we've already discussed this in class, but there's many things that are there. I just wanna talk about three things that are there. First, key issue, which stands as uh, the skeleton in the closet in all the events we do. Nothing, nothing, nothing will ever happen without political support from the top. Um, and it's important that the European Commission said that. And this brings about, in my mind, a question that all my students in the end ask me, is so why don't they do it? Since it's so, and, uh, and why don't they do what? Well, why don't they take uh, into consideration the huge amount of benefits for politicians, for greedy individuals called politicians, even if they were the greediest people? maybe even corrupt people. Why don't they take advantage of all the advantages that we know professionalism uh, can, uh, can uh, give rise to? Look at this, this is the famous paper by uh, Tommaso Valletti, Andrea Pratt, and Oriana Bandiera that says that waste is more than 2% of GDP. More than 2% of GDP. If you identify waste, you have 2% of GDP at your disposal as a politician. If you are a right, as I always say to my students, if you are a right-wing government, you can decrease 
Fiscal pressure by 2% of GDP. Don't tell this to Berlusconi. He's going to be reelected for 30 years. If you are a left-wing government, you can redo all the hospitals, all the schools, all the highways. You're going to be reelected for 30 years. Ministry of Economies and Finance struggled to find 0.1% of GDP. And remember that the important result is 83%. It was mentioned yesterday. The causes of that waste are a 17% due to corruption, 83% due to incompetence. Uh, this is Yossa, Spagnolo, De Carolis, Giuffrida, Molisi, uh, same paper that I told you about. Look at this. This is for United States of America. We're not talking about, the, again, this is an independent argument. This is not about the level of development of any country. 4.8 million days decline in, uh, in delays. Cost of Iran would drop by 6.7 billion. You don't believe in it? These are fantastic researchers. OK, give it a shot. 10% less because of a statistical mistake. It's four millions and six billions. It's huge. Why don't politicians take advantage of this? Everybody would see this. They would be reelected tomorrow morning. And let's not forget that investing in competence has, and we heard it yesterday. We heard it yesterday from Elisabetta. It says, and I don't know if these things are taken into account in the works that they do, but if you have more competence, corruption decline because corruption feeds on incompetence. And yesterday, somebody else said something very interesting. I, I'm sorry, I don't remember the names. You are a lot, once you have competence, you have this striking thing that during negotiations, during uh, the, all the phases of the procurement, you finally are able to talk on the same term with private actors, which brings a whole range of added, added value. But then I add other things. It's, when we talk about professionalism, we also have to think about who makes the rules of the game. Professionalism is on, in procurement is very badly needed in, to polit, for politicians who write the rules. And if you have good procurers, these good procurers will say to politicians, don't write these crazy rules. Look at the Italian new law. I hear see Andrea Pezzoli, who just arrived. The antitrust authority wrote so one year ago, I think, six months ago, saying what the hell is this crazy thing that the Italians have said with the new directive that we should not do tenders where price is given a weight greater than 30%. It must be lower than 30%. What the hell is this? You know what everybody else is doing now? They're giving 70% to quality, but they're inventing quality criteria that everybody has. So they're wasting a lot of time in creating this fake quality that everybody has so as to make the tender back to 100% price. It's ridiculous. And then there's obviously another importance that we should never forget. Uh, there is really bad reputation. A lot of time innovation is stifled, is uh, slowed down because rulers do not want to give discretion. And they do not want to give discretion sometimes because they don't trust the procurers. Even if you have a great class of procurer, one mistake by one procurer, can, it's like TripAdvisor. When you read a restaurant and you see that one, one gives a bad criticism, oh, I'm not gonna go to that restaurant. Which restaurant do you go to? Oh, you need 10 good uh, rating by uh, an individual to go, right? So one guy, one guy's mistake is sufficient to slow down the whole machine of change for discretion and trust. So if you have better competence, we make less mistakes, there's greater reputation for the system, and the virtuous circle starts. Second point, the European Commission. Um, look at the beauty of this. Look at the beauty of these words, and it resonates very much with the private sector um, re requirements that we, re we read. What do these words bring about? Career structure, incentives, obviously money. Where do we find the money? There is no money. We can't pay this very smart guy. There is no money. No money? Are you nuts? 2% of GDP? You have no money? Can't you give 0.2% of GDP to these guys? Look at the beauty of this sentence. This is how the British do it they call investing in the public procurement profession a spend to save business case. I pay them, I pay them a lot, obviously with accountability and whatnot, and I get a lot of savings. And what if you're stuck in a different case? Well, in a different scenario, you are always fixated with saving, 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 there is no money to pay these guys, I'm sorry. Well, good luck, you're gonna have the worst procurers because you haven't invested. Uh, final point, 
it's not only about e-procurement. I think what is interesting about, which we never think so much because it's not that well developed, but I think it has a huge potential, is the last part, aggregation of knowledge and exchange of good practices. There's not enough about, of this in the whole world, I think. And it goes back to an issue I would like, since uh, you all know that I do not stand very much aggregation. Uh, to aggregate knowledge instead is a fantastic thing, but do we need uh, to aggregate organizations? Do we need only concepts or uh, um, uh, the fin what is the name of the Finnish uh, organization? Ansel. To, to do that, and I'm not sure. For example, let's take a best practice, piano in Holland. It's a fantastic experience. Again, all based on interdisciplinarity, where there is a huge, all the public procurers are there, they constantly meet, they do meetings, they share experiences. It's totally decentralized, but it's centralized on this platform where there is knowledge sharing. I think this thing does to the Netherlands much more that we cannot measure than we, than we know. And just to tell you uh, one important thing about comparing. This, I think, is a key issue. When we compare, when we do benchmarking, it really has to be key for saving benchmarking from death is that we compare and we don't compete. And by the way, compete comes from Latin, we've forgotten about it, it means, it comes from cum petere, means running fast together. Why do I say that? I say that because um, there are two ways of using data to benchmark. You can benchmark horizontally across organization, goodbye, you die tomorrow morning. Oh, I, he's better than me. Let me fake my data. Oh, he's better than me. Let me not give the data. Data die in the moment in which you decide to compare things that are completely different. Every single procurement organization is completely different. You can't, you can't compare them anyway. But if you start comparing them across, you're dead. Look at what the Philippines does. It says, do it vertically. You are here today with data. Be here today in three years' time, and we're going to reward you. So use data for internal improvement. And I don't care if somebody starts here and somebody starts here and somebody after three years is still here below. What I care is about not relative, I care about absolute. I care that everybody improves at their own rhythm and they get rewarded for that. That is a key issue of uh, relation to data. Oh my God, five minutes. So Sardinia. Uh, Sardinia is a little bit an incredible experience, um, a little similar to Holland. It's an aggregation of knowledge. Sportello, uh, I don't know, I wanted to translate it. The best way to translate this is Sportello, okay? Sportello is people uh, there to say to, especially to local small firms that don't know how to procure, come to us, we'll explain you. Uh, these are all the things they do. By the way, this is not so much Tor Vergata. We only do the master there. They do tons of other things. Angelo knows very well about that. But what is interesting, is for the first time I have seen indicators of change. You know what was the, why they launched this thing? They launched this initiative because they had a problem. Sardinia was the region with the lowest rate of victories of local firms. All the Sardinian procurement would go to firms outside of the island. Well, what's the answer? Well, one answer is corruption, right? Let's give the awards to the Sardinian firms by corruption. The other answer is, Let's do a center of competence where we teach these firms how to do procurement and look at the results. If they were, these, these results are, one should study them more rigorously, but these results are obviously connected to something different than just corruption. Corruption, probably that 10% of corruption in Sardinia had always been there and still is there. But this is related to competence. It is, it is incredible, it is incredible. Simply by putting together firms and procurers ahead of time. And look at what they do. Thirst, competence, for, uh, thirst, not first, thirst. You want to drink. Once you, you, you start talking about competence, you want to do more things. And now they're calling us and they're saying, we want to do innovative procurement in Sardinia. We want to do pre-commercial procurement. They don't stop. They're launched. Yes, I'm almost done. Uh, so we thought, let's go big. Um, and we thought about uh, Belgrade. And, and again, the question here was, oh my God, these are two rival institutions. No, Tor Vergata should stay on its own. Let's not, let's not talk to Nottingham. Let's not talk to Turin. We want to stay small but alone, right? 
should they mix? And we talked with Velko a lot about this and with, and with Bata subsequently. And my answer is obvious. I'm sorry. There's no way we can do it. I cannot teach in Belgrade, Latin America, and, and what not. I need to do it with somebody else. I can share my knowledge, my being the knowledge of Angelo, the knowledge of all our teachers, the knowledge of Annalisa, the knowledge of all our teachers, the knowledge of Paolo. But it's inevitable that if, if you want to go big, you need to make alliances. But these alliances then have to be based on a single most important tenet. And in my opinion, most important tenet has to do with what I believe. Maybe Bata disagrees with this, but I don't think he disagrees. What I believe was the most important thing that happened in Belgrade this year. I am sorry for all the Angelos and the Pigas of the world, but the most important thing that happened in Belgrade this year is only one thing. Okay, and it has one first name and one last name that nobody of you knows who it is, except a few people. Okay, this lady here. This is the only teacher in the first edition of Belgrade that comes for, from Serbian society. She was a great success. Next year, we're gonna have two, we're gonna have three. Next year, we're gonna have 10. And the more there are Serbian teachers, the less there are Torvergata teachers. Who cares? The ocean is huge, and what's important is that we discuss and debate the issues the way we believe they should be debated. That there's a culture of procurement the way we like it. So that's the result, right, Bader? Uh, it's easy to say, uh, but we can't, it's, it's nice. Bata and I wanted really to go large, but you don't go large if somebody doesn't help you to, make the, to build the boat. And so here the question is about money, it's huge. Public procurers that come to Tor Vergata, come to Belgrade, need to be financed. Typically, governments do not have money. So here, the need for MDBs around is huge. There's nothing I have, there's nothing I have to teach. Hi, Jerim, where is it? Are you there? Yes. Yesterday, you asked, I think, the, the right question. You said, what comes first? And there's many, many dimensions into one uh, that I would like to answer very quickly this question. Um, the first has to do with this. Uh, this was one trap that uh, we can get stuck in. It's a trap of high corruption and low competence where we would like to go in a world of high competence and low corruption, right? And how do we do that? How do we go from one to the other? That is, is the key question. Or you could see things in a different way. You could be stuck in a world where there is no trust for the procurers and rules are abundant. Or you could be stuck in a good equilibrium with discretion granted to procurers, obviously with accountability and trust. All this is a virtual circle. And the question again here, how do we go from one to the other? And um, another way to think about it, the EC way of thinking about it. You could be stuck in an equilibrium where you have no institutional support and you have non-motivated people, or you could be in a world where there is institutional support and you have motivated people, right? And the question again is, how do we go from here to there? And why do I ask that? Because it has to do with the Jerim question of what comes first, in a sense, and I'm done, yes, 30 seconds, yes. <laughs> you could, all, all these things, you could go vertical, you could say, okay, let's fight corruption. I always said no. Yes, keep on fighting corruption, but the back door is very, very important. The back door allows you to go more easily from the red to the green. Start by building high competence. Nobody's gonna notice. Nobody's gonna stop you. If you fight corruption, everybody's gonna stop you. Try still. But if you go through the window, the, uh, the back door of competence, at a certain point, you're gonna be in the room and they are gonna, gonna be able to kick you out. Same thing, uh, rules, no trust, how you build trust from one day. No, you don't build trust in one day. But if you switch to discretion with accountability, if you make that move, I bet that it's more likely then you're going to get trust. And finally, uh, I think this is what mo matters most for our session is, how do you go from non-motivated to motivated people? Well, you could go to see a person and say, hey, get motivated, wake up. What's, pr what's the problem with you? Or you could do the other way and you could say, okay, I'm gonna build institutional support around you. The way the European Commission said, the way the UK government has uh, pioneered. And at that point, it's, uh, all right, and I close with this slide because I say, okay, but then what is going to make us move in the 
green arrow direction. And here the issue, I think, is only one. It's an issue of <laughs> leadership versus risk aversion. We are usually always, I always use the word risk aversion for public procurers. You know what? I think I've done a mistake all my life. It's not about the risk aversion of public procurers. It's about the risk aversion or the capacity to lead of the potential leaders, of what we call the heads of organization. Because if they are not risk averse, then everything follows, and all the arrows then lead. I don't know if this is an answer to Ajurim's question, but I think that these are some issues that we should, we should debate. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gustavo. Uh, of course, um, the, 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 the main uh, picture that comes from your presentation is that uh, competence building is a complex phenomenon. It doesn't only uh, require training, but much, much more. So we can talk about the art of putting science in public procurement. <laughs> Okay, so I'm very pleased to leave the floor now to Karen. You have 30 minutes. <coughs> Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. I'm so grateful to Paolo for the very kind introduction and exceptionally proud to be here representing George Washington University Law School. And thank you very much, Gustavo and Annalisa, for the invitation. I've learned so much being um, in this room this past uh, day. So I um, hope I have a little something to share with you from the American perspective. Um, I chose not to use slides because I feel more earnest when I'm just sort of speaking with my audience. And as um, um, both my colleagues up here explained, I'm speaking really from um, the perspective of not simply knowledge, but the emotional intelligence that is so important for our professionals and really um, coming at that from a perspective right now um, in the context of the United States government, which is in a bit of a state of crisis. And so I want to introduce my remarks with a bit of historical context and then bring it back to, as I think um, Gustavo so ably did, to the mission of our university and the program that we have put together for um, educating professionals and encouraging a professional who has a lifelong desire to continue to learn because I think that is what can be most inspiring um, to achieving improvements in procurement and um, professionalization in the, in the culture. Um, so um, we have in the United States a very um, rigorous set of existing knowledge requirements and continuing education. But I want to take a step back from that and really look at our, um, our system of democracy and the system of government in which the civil servants um, fit. Um, so, you know, the room that we're in is older than my country. Um, we are a very young democratic government, and we were created with this um, vision of having a separation of powers the legislative branch, the executive branch, the judicial branch. And the goal of that was to prevent tyranny, promote liberty, and engage the public in policy making. And the three um, fit together in a very beautiful and very um, sometimes tenuous way because the checks and balances within that system can um, create procedural delays which, um, be, which create some antagonism in a marketplace like the procurement. Um, our administrative architecture, so within the executive branch, in just the last century, um, there was great power concentrated in the executive branch, and that has been split again in three to create a set of checks and balances. So we have the political appointee who is the leader of the agency, but then there are the expert civil servants and the engaged public, the civil society that comments on the rulemaking. And again, the notion that the three are in tension and have a rivalry that is intended to create a very robust um, and active um, governance that is the antithesis of risk aversion. 
because each of those um, elements has to be empowered and strong in order to speak up and create the sort of questioning and conversation that leads to collaboration and better decision making. Um, so this rivalry is very intentional, but it al is also time consuming, which is why when you have an administration that comes in and wants to marketalize the bureaucracy, they become very frustrated with the role of the civil service and they see benefit from disengaging the, the public. Um, it hasn't always been like this. Um, I, I, I told um, Gustavo I was going to talk a little bit from my personal experience. My own um, family, I have lived within four miles of the White House for almost my entire life. My father came to Washington in the 1960s. This was the age of President Kennedy, when young people saw civil service as a vocation. And it was a very inspiring time, and there was an earnest admiration for the work of the civil service. I grew up in that culture, and I myself served in the military and started my career in public service for a government agency. And it was that government agency that saw the potential for me to um, expand my education and sent me to George Washington University in the LLM program. So this has all really come full circle, and I'm seeing this um, crisis that we're in through a very personal, personal lens. Um, in the 1970s, um, the Congress and it created the Administrative Procedures Act, which delegated huge rulemaking authority to the agencies. And again, that's, that works fine when you have this three-part triangle of the civil servants who are checking the administrators, uh, the public appointees, or p political appointees, and you have a, a um, public that is engaged in the rulemaking process. But there was, scholars began to sort of undermine this system by questioning this, um, putting so much authority in one of the three branches. And then issues became very, very complex. The Vietnam War, Watergate, all these things that created angst and worry about, um, and skepticism about how the government um, worked. So it's not just now when we're hearing the current administration talk about how they're, they're vilifying bureaucrats and they are talking about um, minimizing government. This is something that has been building over many years, even in the 1990s and the Clinton administration, there were, um, there were fewer um, and fewer acquisition professionals being asked to do more and more. And the idea was that if we gave them considerable discretion, they will be able to accomplish all that we are asking them. But the um, lack of real professional training in terms of how to be a, how to do the, the risk taking, how to be part of an organization where you are valued that did not come at the same time. And I think that that was dangerous in the beginning of this sort of philosophical shift of acquisition professionals being seen as clerks. Because when you have so many rules in place and the professionals are trained to memorize the rules and apply the rules, they are not seen as the active collaborative members of the acquisition team, which includes the lawyers, the program managers, the decision makers at the, even at the political level. So the danger that we are in now has been growing as we have limited the role of acquisition professionals to um, rule experts. I think that is the most important aspect of professionalism that we in the United States need to move toward. So I want to um, advocate for something that is going to be very costly and frankly require a considerable um, shift in perspective. But as um, Gustavo described the UK's spend to save theory, um, that is exactly what we need to be doing now. Otherwise, we will find ourselves in a constitutional crisis. And there are constitutional scholars we have, we were visited by um, 
Professor John Michaels from UCLA who talked um, to our students this year about the democratic crisis that we are in by, um, and, it, and it is impacting uh, or impacted by the, um, the diminution of the civil service role. And so I very personally, again, see what we are doing at GW as nurturing the role and empowering our students, even if they are entering the private sector after they graduate, that we are part of this community and the conversations that we have to be taught to really understand how to do. So by the end of my presentation, I will talk about how very specifically we build these skills because for many years it has been treated as either these are soft skills that you either have or you don't have or they're really just too difficult to teach. Um, but again, I think this is a very important role that, that we serve and, and my, my um, encouragement to you is that these are skills that are improved through practice. So the things that you have done here, even perhaps without realizing it, the group projects, the being in the classroom that is essentially this laboratory of people coming from different countries, different backgrounds, different um, systems, that that is what really gives you your power and that that is what you need to continue to engage in and refine when you leave here and enter practice. Um, so the, so the, in the United States right now, what I see is that these key characters, characteristics of civil service, the professionalism, the inclusivity, and the legalism have really been devalued. And again, it's re reached a crisis point with the current administration that chance drain the swamp. I mean, this is me, my father, my neighbors, and I. So you can understand the, um, the impact that this has on, on the morale of the people who joined the civil service as a vocation, who saw and believed in what they were doing because they believed in the power of government to make change and to solve problems. And when the, um, the, the rulemaking um, uh, role of the administration has also been um, put on hold, the current administration says that they do not want any new rules made unless two rules are undone. It's a wildly ambiguous and capricious rule that no one understands how to apply, so rulemaking is not happening. That is how our public gets engaged because our rules, when they are in the process of being, um, uh, when they are first drafted, they are put on notice. The public can see a rule that is in, um, in the process of being made by a federal agency and they can comment on it. And this often doesn't take, this isn't necessarily the individual um, voter, but it is the organizations, the professional organizations that represent the private sector. And when there's no rulemaking being done, there's no opportunity for that engagement. And so what you're really starting to see is the bottom falling out of that triangle of the agency, political appointee who is um, pushing aside the um, civil servant by making them appear to be more of a clerk and paper pusher and de-emphasizing the role of the public. And that, that is the crisis that we are in. It also does not help that since the 90s, one of the means for um, demonstrating to the public that, the, that we're trying to reduce the size and, um, the, and slowness of, of government has been to outsource um, so heavily. And my colleague Steve Schooner has, has written about this, about the hidden um, costs in marketizing agencies procurement functions because there are hidden overhead costs and because you don't have enough acquisition of professionals to manage and track the contract um, in the performance stage, they simply lose count of even how many um, contractors are working for a particular agency. And this again, the, the concern is not really to my mind the greedy contractor because a contractor 
will do anything that they can to maintain their strong past performance rating and to keep the agency happy. So what's more dangerous is when the political appointee wants to really implement very quickly their, their policy agenda. And they can use contractors to do that more quickly than the civil servants who are the experts and have been have this vocation of having a rivalrous, engaged, and debating role in the process. So the danger of, of this continued level of outsourcing in the name of reducing government is actually an, has an impact on our democratic goals. Um, so what can we do um, in academia to, to stem this crisis? Um, I think the presentation that Gustavo made, again, is so inspiring because it demonstrates the way that institutions um, within the academic setting and the um, government setting and even in private um, uh, marketplace can come together and bring these people into the classroom together. And that's what we've been able to do at George Washington University. And that's why I, again, very personally, when I was a young attorney in the federal government, you know, law school was one thing. In the United States, you know, you have four years of college. It doesn't really matter what you've specialized in. You go to law school, and the first year, everyone learns the same fundamental theories. And then in the last two years, you're really not encouraged to specialize. So for me, law school didn't make a lot of practical sense. I sort of struggled to figure out what was I going to do with this. But I knew I had this vocation to serve in the military. And when I arrived at the US Army Corps of Engineers, which has a vast responsibility for civil works and relies heavily on contractors to do that, and I was sent back into the classroom after, you know, after a long day's work, I would take the subway and, and go into the classroom, and there was Steve Schooner bounding about on the stage. And suddenly, it all started to make sense. I understood how those theories that I had originally learned in the first year of law school, constitution law, how that impacted what I was doing on a daily basis at the Corps of Engineers. Administrative law, I was doing it on a daily basis. I was actively engaged in the conversations in the classroom because I could demonstrate ways that my agency was interpreting rules in a different way than one of my classmates. So what Gustavo was talking about, the, the joy of a teacher gaining knowledge from their students, um, I now see that on the other side as the teacher in the classroom. And so there is nothing that gives me more hope for the professionalization of this field in, again, those most important elements of being um, able to, and here, here comes my sort of list of the essential professional skills that will allow or empower um, civil servants to take on that very difficult role that they have to serve as a rival to the, um, to the um, agency officials. We need clear and compelling communication skills. These can be taught, but it is very difficult from the perspective of the, institution, the academic institution to provide the individualized training that is needed. And so we do that at GW by investing in the adjunct professors, the faculty members who are practitioners by day, but can um, we, we create the kind of student-faculty ratio so that students can practice a writing assignment and do it without the fear of failure because this is the major stumbling block for acquisition professionals. When we say, take a chance, don't be risk averse. Well, there, in our society, there is so much at stake when you make a mistake and it's on the front page of the Washington Post. That's, that is the rule in the government agency. You don't want to see this procurement on the front page of the Washington Post. So, but you cannot learn to take risks without being supported and seeing what it means to fail and how to achieve that. The safest place to do that is in the classroom. And frankly, the best way to do it is in writing assignments, 
where the students are getting feedback from the reader as to why this was not a particularly compelling way that you were presenting your idea. It wasn't as clear as I needed it to be, especially given the diversity of our audience. The only way that we are going to get our public engaged is if they can read and understand the rules that we are presenting. If they are encouraged to be engaged because the medium makes sense to them. So no longer can we have pages and pages and columns of our federal register and expect for our public to be engaged. We need to figure out how to be blogging. We need to figure out how to use social media. And the one good thing about those methods is that they force the, the writer to be concise, precise, and engaging with their reader. And that is not something that you can say to someone, start doing that tomorrow. That's what we do in the classroom with this training. And it, this, the, the, the confidence that students gain when they see how they have come so far and the feedback has improved over these several months and they are now being told this is what you're doing right rather than everything that you're doing is wrong because that is the tendency in law school that your paper is marked up like it's bleeding with red but as they turn the corner and they see what they are doing well this is how we encourage that um, that spirit of um, confidence in how they communicate and then they become better listeners and that's what's really lacking because listening is at the heart of empathy and respect and understanding really why we have this three-part system. It doesn't work if it's the top-down approach. It also doesn't work if it's just a squeaky, nagging wheel. It works if we are communicating and listening and understanding that there are things that we can agree on and that we can adjust and then achieve the result that meets the outcomes that we were all looking for. And, you know, sadly, it's the last generation of our leaders, people like Senator McCain, um, who created um, really momentous legislation because they were willing to collaborate with people who had different political backgrounds, but they were listening to each other, they were actively engaged in the writing and revising process. And these are things that we do in the classroom every day. But unless we explain and articulate to our students that this is exactly what you will be doing when you return to your organization, they may not necessarily appreciate that this seminar paper that seems so hard to do and takes such agony, the writing process. Um, and so out of this, comes that work ethic that is really the, the three parts, um, if, if I would say what, we, what our students learn and gain from working on professional skills. It's the communication, the listening and empathy and respect, and then the ethic, because it does take such hard work. But if you understand why you're doing it, you will continue to do it, and you will inspire those around you to do it, and then the entire organization um, benefits. Um, the last thing I'll say about this is that I think on the science piece, this can be brought online. We can bring far, there's an entire ocean that separates us, right? We don't have this beauty of being able to go um, to Belgrade with our program. But we can bring these programs online using the writing assignments and using video conferencing technology to recreate that engaged classroom because what really matters most is who is in the classroom with us. That we have this diversity of perspective because that is what our founding fathers really always wanted was that we avoid tyranny and promote liberty by listening and having rivalrous conversations. So that is my great hope. And I am so grateful to have being part of this conversation today, and I cannot wait to hear what you have to say. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Karen, for your inspiring presentation. Your emphasis on emotion and ethics is also very, very important. Now it's uh, your turn. So are there questions? Good. Um, 
first time. Please state your name and state your name for asking the question. Yeah, my name is Alexander Edgar Mock. I'm a PhD from uh, Leiden University in Holland, and my question is for Professor Piga. Um, as you know, I'm from Holland, and we all wear wooden shoes. We all live in windmills. Um, we all grow tulips in the garden. Mm. We all implement European policies impeccably on all levels of government, higher level, middle level, lower level. Okay. Let me talk a little bit about uh, piano and ask you a question. Um, piano is part of the Ministry of Economic Affairs and dedicated to the higher and the middle level of government. We in Holland, we also have Europe Decentral, and they are there for the communities, part of the uh, Union of Communities, and they are closely linked to the Ministry of Internal Affairs. Um, so you have different groups, economic affairs and internal affairs, and they all give information about public procurement. The same information, but totally separated from each other. My question is, um, hearing you talk about professionalization of uh, procurement, eh? do you have any thoughts on how to implement uh, European, let's say, uh, professionalization of procurement uh, from far away Brussels into the local entities in the, in the, in the countries and then how to uh, get it to, let's say, to the, to the shop floor, to the people having to use all the laws and all the directives? I agree with you, right? your statements are clear, we have to professionalize and what the union says, etc. But I was struck by your remark that you say it's so valuable and at the same time it's so useless. Thank you. <coughs> by the way, I know little of piano and I know there are some people who work there. I did not know about the Minister of Interior Localities. Um, I don't know, it's, it's a good question. I, I, I think I talk about these issues uh, because I think that the, the push from the bottom is uh, under-evaluated and we tend to always in Europe think from the top to the bottom. And I think that initiatives instead that take advantage <coughs> of certain gu guidance from the European Union <coughs> but then take matters on their own are more important and should be uh, frankly, even financed. Uh, and, and I say that because I see uh, my always my great worry is not about large firms and multinationals, but my, my main issue is about um, the informational asymmetries for small firms, the huge fixed cost that they have in information acquisition, and the fact that probably there is a part of public procurement that uh, can really change the life of small firms in making them become, at the beginning stage of their life, uh, more dynamic, more capable of surviving, and more capable of uh, becoming an international actor. Um, and so in that sense, uh, having initiatives that go local, that talk directly to the actors that have mostly to gain from these things, which is small firms, I think are really, are really, really relevant. I'm not saying that uh, things that come from the top are not, uh, but I think that we have a lack of resources invested there where we could gain the most. So when I read about piano, I say, wow, this is fantastic. This is probably much more useful than 10 other initiatives that we've had. When I look at Sardinia, I say, wow, look at what they've done in four or five years. Not saying this, I'm not saying it's a life changer, but my main concern about public procurement is the fact that we don't understand enough how relevant it can be uh, for changing the life of society through small actors' growth, if that's enough of an answer. From Brussels, uh, we've talked about it with Nikita and expert groups so many times. We have, the, I think that the European Commission has a problem. It doesn't know how to make it mandatory for states 
to push on professionalism. And we've debated a lot. My point has always been you dictate so many crazy things to member states than to dictate such a minor thing as professionalism, but really mandate, not recommend, make it mandatory, as we were saying yesterday with uh, the debate between Angela and, and Pedro, uh, would be the real value added. I mean, uh, this government do not do it, just m make them start, uh, force them to do it. Um, say that it's impossible to do procurement without uh, a certification program. Uh, once again, certification is a necessary but not sufficient condition. Then you have to organize organizations around it. But what I see is really a very low speed, uh, possibly for good reasons, because maybe training uh, takes away people from their job, so organizations resent that. Uh, but we have all the numbers that say that uh, with competence, we've heard at all this conference, there's such an increase in, in value added that to me, somebody needs to move. And the only thing that the European Commission can do, in my opinion, possibly is to put some funding, but otherwise simply to mandate. But I would like to hear Nikita also what he thinks about this. Thank you for both presentations. My name is Guillermo Rosenburse from Buenos Aires, Argentina. <coughs> Mike, <coughs> I basically agree with uh, what has been said in both presentations, but my concern is, uh, again, how to put uh, the recommendations in practice. You um, pointed out quite correctly the, um, the dictum that uh, Spending uh, implies uh, savings, but uh, and also uh, the need to political support. Um, but it is very difficult to to convince politicians uh, about the the sequence: first spend, then uh, get the savings particularly in most uh, developing countries where it is not only an issue uh, to decrease the, the rate of growth of spending, but uh, in many times uh, politicians are forced to reduce fiscal deficits and fiscal spendings. So uh, to prove with facts uh, that you can save uh, from um, a better procurement process, as you say, 2% of uh, GDP in, in the best of cases. To, to prove it and to explain it is uh, extremely important. So uh, this kind of initiatives, uh, <coughs> additionally to, to um, professionalize the the practitioners should uh, take a, a stance to advocate for this kind of initiatives uh, at the political level, because otherwise we'll, we will be um, in a in vicious circle. We'll, we might end up uh, training capable um, professionals in, in the field, but we, weren't, we won't be able to motivate them because at the political level, the, there won't be the understanding. And my second point is that multilateral organizations should uh, put their actions where their mouth is uh, as well. Because for instance, uh, we now are in Argentina under a program, a standby program um <coughs> negotiated with the IMF and we are forced to make a huge savings in, 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 public sev uh, in public spending, but uh, um, the, I mean the, <coughs> the support of, from IDBs to this kind of, of initiative is completely lacking in, in Argentina and I guess in, in many other 
developing countries. All the focus is in short-term savings, nothing uh, uh, in terms of uh, building a different kind of, of uh, state performance. Um, thank you very much for the, that comment and question. I, um, one of the reasons that I mentioned Senator McCain as one of our sort of last generation of um, legislators is because he has um, created a commission that is studying why we do not have as robust a sense of vocation among our young people for civil service or frankly military service and um, what can be done about that. So what might come of some uh, study and legislation to follow that would be the creation of, like we have for each of the branches of the military, we have four-year institutions for, these are middle, military academies, the Naval Academy, the West Point, um, and that we could create a similar institution for civil service um, I think this would go a long way toward re ach achieving what that sort of golden age in the 60s of the earnest admiration for civil service. But it would take that kind of investment in education. There are also, when I was training for the military, I didn't go to the West Point, I did training in college. There are things that we can see the government investing both in private institutions and public. Um, and I agree with you any time that we can have the civil society multinational organizations supporting that as well would be very important. Thank you for the questions. I obviously leave the question on MDBs to the MDB people, but uh, I still stress that <coughs> we've seen support from MDBs a lot. Um, and a lot is obviously a, an absolute value. We could discuss whether a lot is a lot or a lot is not a lot. Um, is it difficult? I don't, I don't think it's difficult at all. I think that we have the experience of the UK. They woke up one morning, they saw that they had a problem with the organizational model, and they said, we want to make the procurers become like judges or diplomats. They enter into the career and they live in the career. They did it, it's not expensive. But I want to stress one thing. I think we are so close to doing it. If I think of where we stood uh, 10 years ago, this debate was totally absent, Angela, correct me if I'm wrong. We had all our procurers in Europe study the book of law. Now we do conferences, we have the European Commission that came out, we are done, we are done, we just need to push one more step. We're very close, it's really cheap. So let's keep on, we are, we are an incredible lobby of change. The procurers are an incredible lobby of change. They complain in the office, they complain all the time. Yesterday you had a very nice, probably wrong, conspiracy theory. And now the, the theory you're suggesting is simply that politicians do not still understand or they're stupid or is there something else? I'm saying that, uh, <laughs> I'm saying that there is a fight between the bottom and the top. Mm -hmm. And why <laughs> on the top are fighting? Why why? Why are they fighting? I mean. They can save money, they can pursue their political agenda. Why are they fighting? That's the question I asked when I said in the slide, why don't they do it in front of all this? But do you uh, have a theory? A conspiracy theory, yes. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> yes, yes, I do have it, and Nikita knows it very well. I think that uh, I think that in the United States there is a culture of the small firm, and I think that the European project, I'm sorry Nikita to say it, is too largely in the hands of multinationals. This is my belief. We think big when we think about procurement uh, in Europe. We think small when we think about procurement in the United States. It's a culture. You read the Small Business Act. It says that the security, the security defense of the nation is based on the protecting the small firms because these ensure the competitiveness of the system in the long run. When we talk about competition, we talk about competition in a tender. They talk about competition in 20 years. So it's a different culture. but. Is it a problem? We, we win the battle. We will change the culture. Okay. The it takes time. Yes. Thank you. Stop behind you. Riman Brezdevishin, uh, Minister of Economy, Lithuania. Uh, I don't want to raise a question, but I want to share our good experience. Uh, we wrote a project uh, for professionalization for European Commission, and we got financed 
and uh, OECD is implementing th this project and helping Lithuania in professionalization issues. First of all, we do we are in the middle of a project right now, so I cannot share all the consequences of that project, but the, the OECD is planning to train our trainers uh, in many in many particular procurement areas and also to help us to write a strategy how to make all the workforce professionalized. So maybe, I hope next year I could share our experiments, how that project worked, but some movements are moving on and I, we cannot say that European Commission guidelines on professionalization are useless. Thank you. Can I, can I say one thing on this? Yeah, sure. Okay, so this is a perfect history. He's my friend, so I have a conflict of interest, okay? Mm -hmm. So I, I did not mention the OECD. If I take the OECD, where, where is he? Where is Paolo? If I take the OECD f 15 years ago, the OECD was null. What happened in the OECD? There's a gentleman that came, arrived. He, he's never going to admit it because he's a, he's a modest guy. He arrived, and he had ideas, and he said, this is an important topic. And guess what? The morning after, we have a country that works with OECD on that direction. So it takes leadership, it takes one person, and then everything unravels. Yeah. yeah, okay. First of all, thank you both of you for excellent presentation, <coughs> emotionally and ethically based. Uh, Talking about this, what I would call a uh, building of capacity. I should say, share experience from institution I'm coming from. And that's what happened exactly ac according to your, let's call, let's call it the recipe, that the management of the institution uh, in the phase of, you know, when it was not on the sun and ex exposed uh, to the winds. We were working on building capacity. And especially on transparency of in this institution. And later on, as you said, it, wa it was too late for, for politicians to put, put any pressure because dealing with transparency, everything was online, uh, on everybody's uh, concern and dealing with with expertise th that's okay running goal you can never reach it because you have uh, always new knowledges and you have uh, fluctuation in and human resources but I, I should say that it, it has happened it is possible but what's what I'm worried is that it happened either spontaneously or either rational. But it's not the part of the system. Uh, and nevertheless, system politically, formally said, yes, that's the right way, but uh, no support was done. So I, I want just to share our experience. Thank you for your excellent presentations. You inspired me and uh, that is one of the main issues that uh, uh, is uh, obviously the most important in every country. First of all, I am 30 years of the faculty and I was uh, in a different positions in the government, around the government, and I spent most of the time to convince politicians that in their private interest is to do in public interest. So I led a, a local government reform in one country in the region and we were working in one municipality and mayor was doing everything to block us on a different ways. I said, could we go to your office? And then I asked him, when are the next elections? He said, in two years. I said, would you like to win with the results, obvious results for your citizens or we have the uh, saying, selling the fog you know, marketing without any uh, result. And he said, till now no one told me that. I said, because you were surrounded with the people so-called yes sir. 
Evet Efendi in the Turkish Empire. So uh, this is the fight. It is not that something will you will get. It is something that every day we have to convince them and this is the best way that they realize that this is in their interest. Another thing related to what was mentioned concerning uh, discretionary powers. When we drafted strategy, anti-corruption strategy, Transparency International said discretionary powers means corruption. Of course that this is wrong. One thing that is missing is exactly what you mentioned, responsibility. So if you have responsible people and they have knowledge and skills, then you get the best possible results. And uh, also what you mentioned, why it is important to include everyone in the legislative process. Uh, in English this is much better. Uh, I am saying when there is a public debate, usually it is too late. So you need consulting process from the beginning. And who should be involved? Persons that are in uh, sitting today and they are coming from different environment and they can help to reduce possibility to make mistakes. When I led working groups for different laws, I involved all stakeholders from the beginning. They were confused and I said it is important because if you were not informed from the beginning you will be against that even if you don't have any argument. Another thing, I really like to reduce possibility to make mistake. That law was not changed in Serbia more than 15 years, which is impossible. Later I will speak more about Mission Impossible, Tor Vergata and Belgrade Law School. Thank you. Uh, my question is, how do we, you know, from your, your perspective, experience, how, how can we, you know, motivate, you know, the armed forces, you know, to, to, to persuade, you know, politicians to agree with, my, you know, we have, let's have a certification, you know, program. You know, that's uh, in that law, you know, at least uh, some provision in procurement law, the PPP law, that the mandate, you know, you know, a program, you know, to invest in you know, professionalism. I join in the first place. I join your 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 armed forces. You know, you know, uh, to make a strong argument. But do you have an action plan? I think that you know the European development on um, profession, uh, professional, you know, there's some uh, public procurement is a, is a great support to me when I move back to China to you know to make an argument for my government to do something the same. Uh, but do you have an action plan? You know, how to motivate more you know, armed forces to fight? the battle successfully. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, can we, you know, we may, we may, you know, uh, set up, a, you know, alliances along the research and the educational centers, you know, in public procurement, say, uh, this university, University of Turin, and my university, you know, in Argentina, University in Argentina, in Belgrade, and, uh, you know, to do something uh, together. Since we, the questions are now, the people are uh, supposed to ask questions are now three more, <laughs> they're growing, I would suggest to keep all of them, please take notice of yeah. the, the questions that are asked and then we'll have a final uh, round. Welcome. Well, I guess uh, somebody has to break the ice about uh, MDBs, right? Or we sometimes call them IFIs. Maybe we should invent another acronym and confuse everybody. You all know what's IFIs and MDBs, right? Well, it puts me in a very comfortable position as a, f a present photographer and former <laughs> MDB employee in two institutions uh, to share with you some statistics and some facts. For example, we started with uh, Tor Vergata many years, many moons ago, this program, and uh, we're looking forward to celebrate the 10th anniversary, I guess, very soon because we already are mastering, I guess, the sixth generation. Uh, it started as a pilot program, and it started with a lot of enthusiasm. And let me bring into the uh, formula our good friends, and uh, I would say somebody who inspired us a lot, uh, a CI, CHE, Central European Initiative. Without their vision and support, I would say it would be very difficult and hard for EBRD to make that first step. 
And in particular, in Che, if we didn't have this visioner, Mr. Paolucci, our good friend Guido, thank you for coming, uh, it would not have happened. As you said, and it was repeated here, more and more so, it is important to have um, brave people that have the vision, that trust what we're doing and push ahead. And this was a pilot, and the pilot, I think, in the text of uh, this TC, which was 40,000 euros, I have to say the figure because it's so small, right? Um, it was said, pilot once and never again. And we transformed that never again into another five successful generations. And uh, the results, and I will not take much of your time, is that we have about 200 students to graduate between those that attended the master here in Rome as well as the Belgrade cohort. 40 plus countries, about 19 institutions. Sort of, we're starting to see it. We had good discussions and always keep good conversation with our friends in the IDB, World Bank, African Development Bank, and the fact that the African Development Bank is here. Uh, also, I think, it's, uh, you know, we follow the show and tell, invited them to come in. They felt comfortable, they supported it. After these all seven years, or six generations, I would say, the president of the BRD mentioned, and he said it clearly, there's no other project better than this one that the EBRD did in its whole career. And this was also supported by the vice presidents of EBRD attending, following, being part of this beautiful story. Uh, they, quote unquote, they're sitting there with the blessing when uh, there was this agreement signed between University of Rome and, and, and University of Belgrade two years ago. And uh, I would say it's not only the support in money. You know, we have to display the logos of those that contribute with money, but I would say that the World Bank is almost there and they have been supporting us, working with us all along, present with their understanding, blessing and support, as well as always participating in our modules of the IFIs, which is great encouragement to all of us, I would say, and other banks, EIB, etc. Uh, I know that Enzo is now fighting to, to grab the microphone, so, you know, whenever you want, I can pass it on to you. But uh, I want to say that it's rather simple. Looking on, the, on this side, um, money is always an issue, but as, as MDBs would like to say, money is not really an issue. What we need, we have a lot of money. What we need is good ideas. And also to my friend, because I think that the question was raised from the uh, uh, University in Argentina, it takes two for tango, as we saw in one of the slides. We need to have this big number, you know, a roster of people waiting to be engaged in these master programs. EAB, uh, IDB, for example, has launched something last year, and the results of going through, percolating through the ministries and all the official channels was very minimal. Practically, we could not get candidates that are qualified to, to come and join the program. And also, I would advocate, because there was some insinuation or, or about online, etc., very useful, but not as a starting point, and I think this is not going to be good if we start with the online rather than doing presence as we're doing here, to hear and feel the breath and the feeling of the students in class and understand their anxiety inspire them to ask further questions, that cannot be done online. We are, as I like to say in the professionalization of procurement, still in the barbershop. You remember barbershop medicine 200 years ago? If you needed any medical issue, tooth, get a cut, you would go to the barbershop. Today we have a profession formidable with so many directions. So, you know, we're in the barbershop, we have to do uh, work together, we have to encourage governments and also from the universities, I would say, to, to look for candidates and build this critical mass. The mass of 200 students in 40 countries is already showing us the, the sign of a, of a good direction in building the critical mass. Thank you very much.
So my name is Andrea Pizzoli, Italian Competition Authority. I thank both of you for your, I mean, presentation. I mean, I'm guilty because yesterday I didn't attend the conference, so possibly the question I'm going to ask uh, has already dealt uh, in yesterday's discussion. But I mean, uh, I mean, my question has been inspired by some of the last uh, slides of Gustavo's presentation, the slides concerning the relationship between corruption and uh, competence and skills. Uh, my question is something like that. I mean, I am pretty aware that there is a positive relationship which goes from corrupt, from skills, high competence, towards corruption. I mean, the higher the skills, the lower the corruption. It's much. I'm not that sure that the other way around works, especially if the fight against corruption is mainly based on procedural and bureaucratic tools. So my fear is that in this case, even higher skills might mean skills in formal issues, in procedural issues, which are not so interested in the outcome. So formalities of the process rather than effectiveness of the outcome. Possibly my view is quite parochial because it's something like that is happening in our country because civil servants are really scared of being discretionary because, I mean, they are really afraid of taking decision. And I think that there is a relationship between this fear and the way we want, I mean, positively fight against corruption. I, I mean, the question is directed to both of you even if the slides are Gustavo's. Thank you very much. And first of all, it's really a fantastic panel, so congratulations. Um, my uh, reflection, I don't have a question, but I have a reflection that it actually is very much uh, sort of linked to what Dr. Pizzoli just, just said. And I wanted to put it in a broader context from the perspective of an institution that spends a lot of time and resources on capacity building, right? And it's a stated objective of the policy, of the new policy. It's not just, you know, compliance, and, but it's capacity building. So capacity building is the broader, right? And, 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 and it's a very complex and very multi-year effort in the countries where we work. So there, one important consideration about building the capacity, moving from this compliance base to this principle and performance approach, which needs to take into account, well, several things. First of all, procurement is part of the machinery of government, right, of what makes institutions effective. So there are many different parts, moving parts. So it's part really of this, you know, um, financial management, um, you know, uh, cycle, right, that in starts from planning and goes through uh, auditing and, and evaluation and all these different parts. So there are all these different parts have to be very much synchronized in order for the capacity to produce the results, right? To really, for the performance. To one, one of the most difficult part of this, and this is the, there were many comments on the stakeholders, right? In our countries at least, is the auditing function, right? The Supreme Audit Institution and the role they play. Because as you change the capacity building and the results of capacity building to performance and, and, and to results, you also need to change the basis for accountability and the basis for performance measurement. And that is very slow to change, right? You may, you may change the safety in the rules and there is great risk in not following the rules in most countries, right? So those parts sometimes don't change as the procurement reform, you know, provides this environment where you can make professional decision, but then you are held accountable for. So this is actually very similar to the comment made before, but, but this is the most difficult thing. So this is one thing to keep in mind, because here you're creating policy makers that go back and really, really can help drive this change. And, 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 and to this, there's a lot of different parts of it. Of course, there's also technical aspects to do in the how-to, you know, not just the rules, but how to engage with the market, how to measure, and how to make decisions that are trade-offs, 
the trade-offs made at every stage of the process between cost and, and opportunity and, and alternatives and professional judgment, and that needs to be evaluated on results and performance and not on compliance. So, you know, that's a very, very difficult thing. The second thing that I wanted to say that is also critical in my view to make a real progress on this agenda, it's the holy grail that we've been discussing with Gustavo and others for years, it's to creating some sort of international standards, right? Well, for the accounting profession, for the uh, auditing profession, there are international standards that started from very small, you know, platforms, uh, and they became international organizations that set the standard. Now, it's more difficult for procurement because it's much more political. I completely recognize that. Nevertheless, whatever progress we can make toward those standards can really help go beyond what we're doing in each individual countries and in each individual. For that, I think it's really an international partnership that's very delicate and difficult to put together, but where universities play a critical role. So the more we put together a generation, a cadre of, um, of procurement professional policy makers that you know, are trained on, on similar standards uh, and thinking the same way, the more we are um, getting closer to that goal, Again, it's not going to be like Intosai or IFAC when you have these standards that basically you're an accountant in one country is the same in the other, more or less. It's not going to be that way, but it's going to be much closer to that, you know, really driving global changes where procurement becomes a profession and really becomes something that you can, to some degree, transfer in terms of, you know, how you make decision trade-offs and within a regu regulatory framework, which is different, just starting point, but you make very similar. And what does that mean? That means really delivering results on a global level uh, as procurement as a critical tool for, for economic growth and, and, uh, you know, and development from our point of view. So I think you guys are playing you know, the probably pivotal role in that. There are also professional organizations, there are international MDBs and others. So I think to me, one of my biggest dreams, and I think you need to dream, there was somewhere I wrote, I read that the quote from uh, who was it from that if you don't dream, you don't achieve? Last night at the restaurant. <laughs> yeah, Walt Disney. Now I remember, Walt Disney. So, uh, you know, my dream is uh, reaching a level where we have um, something like a professional, international professional standard for procurement, a global platform that sets standards for learning, for, for accreditation, and for um, performance measurement. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much to all of you for your uh, comments and questions. I would leave, uh, yeah, one minute. <laughs> one uh, final round for final remarks to the two the speakers. Karen, thank you. go first. Thank you. To be here, I'm grateful for these comments. I think I want to speak to the students in the room um, in answering the question about an action plan because. When I hear um, requests for how to create new performance measurements, I think like a teacher first and foremost. I'm not a scholar, I'm a teacher. And when I figure out what it is that I want the students to leave my classroom with, it's my responsibility to identify what the learning outcomes are. And I think that's exactly what we need to put more emphasis on these skills into our learning outcomes. And that's a hard job for the professors to figure out how to teach these skills. But we can do it. We're doing it in other aspects. We do it with our first year law students who we are sending out into the profession for the first time. So we can share these um, pedagogical tools and together we can accomplish what is essentially a set of international standards. And to the students, what we're really talking about here is for you to get out of your comfort zone. I think someone last night said, remember your first day here, and remember how anxious you were and how you weren't really sure what was being expected of you. Remember that tingle when you go back to your office, because now you are so much more powerful and confident. But speak truth to power. Do You have the confidence now, you have performed here, you have achieved what your professors set out for you to achieve. Give them the straight talk that the decision makers whom you advise and whom you are working for, give them the straight talk that they need. If you are the leader, seek it out and say thank you. Be the model for the respectful um, professional 
and share the good stories. Too often we only hear the bad news stories. People in Washington think contracting officers are people who stuff money in their pocket and you know, award contracts. But amplify the good news stories of the people around you and that is how we start to turn the tide. Thank you. Besides subscribing 100% what Karen just said. Uh, I agree with Andrea. There is a huge uh, issue of uh, danger of formal issues. For example, just to give you a sense, the Italian law based on the directive says that we should have a qualification system. Where is that? Uh, it should come out in a rule. Where is the rule? We don't know. It has disappeared for two years. It's hidden for two years. How many times have universities been called to discuss with the ministry about those incredible rules? Never. We are so scared. You know why we're so scared? Because what we fear is that from to, if, the, if the rule comes tomorrow and it's not going to be discussed with the universities, all of a sudden we're going to have 1,000 certificators out there that will price at 1,000 euro their program, <coughs> providing formally exactly what we provide, and then us being crowded out. So I think you are really touching on something even important, as his answer when he says, yes, within this change, auditing, the auditing culture has to change, and it's very slow to change. And let me take the chance to close on this issue of data, because it then it brings about the role of uh, open society, which I did not discuss before. Um, first of all, where there are data, most of the time we see that they're not used. Uh, they're not used especially for what matters most, which is good stories, because they have this high potential. Uh, what I fear even more is that they are used badly. And here, open society comes in, because I know that when I put out data on some procurement where I see one guy with a low price and one guy with a high price for the same tender, then I know that the morning after, in the newspapers, this guy is gonna be crucified. And maybe this guy is the hero and this guy is the corrupt guy with the low price. So I am really scared about the role that civil society could play in this fantastic uh, intentional rivalry that um, Karen was talking about. And I think that we should discuss a little bit more, not so much how to involve civil society after the fact, which is basically an issue of lack of trust. I wanna know what you have done because I don't trust you, but much more ex ante where civil society then gives a mandate to procurers and to politicians with a concept of trust behind it, and obviously accountability too. But then the accountability should be done a little bit, a little bit the Filipino way. Uh, I have the data within the organization, I trust the organization, I monitor it. I don't feed newspapers every day with data that can destroy the whole profession in one second. And so this debate, I think, should be discussed uh, quite a lot. Okay, thank you very much. Before closing the session, just let me remind you that in, the, in your folder you'll find a questionnaire for feedback and suggestions, so you're kindly <laughs> and uh, strongly encouraged to fill it in and leave it at the, at the, at the, at the desk. So let uh, thank again the two speakers for their fantastic work.